I love to invest in anything, but being able to get to the point where you're not trading time for money for your whole adult career is a really worthy goal to strive for because if you are able to accomplish it sooner, you're not going to trade time anymore. You're just going to spend time with your family. Obviously, that's a better choice to make. Then I can have 10 out of 10 attention with my family, with the, my loved ones. Being in Go Abundance, not just elite, but champions. What I realized was as much as a lot of people strive to get their horizontal income numbers higher, the real way you can get that higher is if you well, you are a real estate broker you have a team where are you based out of and how long have you been doing that yep uh born and raised in san francisco i'm based about 15 minutes south of there in a city called milbury california and um been doing it for ever since out of college it's been 13 years now going on 13 years san francisco scares me right now, in particular in the in the commercial uh, market, honestly, like the downtown, like I worry about it being the next Detroit. There's a lot of vacancy that's not economic yet, but is physical. And when that turns and you're at a, I mean, what's the occupancy downtown, like 40, 50%, it's scary. What say you being on the ground? What does it look like? What's the reality? Yeah. We, we definitely see the same things, the headlines that everyone sees. There's definitely a concern for the commercial spaces, specifically, like you said, the office spaces in San Francisco. Um, residential has been relatively strong. Condos in the city has been really slow. Single mm -hmm. families has been low inventory, just like everywhere else, and prices are pretty firm. Uh, in the peninsula or Silicon Valley down south, I would say that office space is a little stronger just because um, it's 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 different than the city. The city's very urban and dense. Um, the city, yeah, could be in for some trouble for a prolonged period, especially office space. Is there an upside? Is there a change politically that's happened recently or that you see on the horizon? Like, is there? It feels like even <laughs> even the most um, I'll say like you know liberal minded San Franciscan who might not want the police in town and, you know, hey, leave people, all of that. Even they're like, hey, it's gone a little too far, <laughs> it seems like. But is there is there a sea change at all? Are you seeing anything change in the San Francisco area, good or bad? There, there's definitely shifts. Um, it's it, it's I would say it's on more of an up and up than trending towards a kind of bottom, so to say. And the reason why I say that is I follow specific people um, on Twitter and they are all about creating change so that we can bring San Francisco back to what it used to be, however you want to describe that. Sure. And there's different coalitions, there's different kind of groups that are getting together that are supporting certain candidates and not others, depending on their policies. So I would say it's going to take a lot of time, uh, just like the office space, the commercial yeah. space, it's going to take time, who knows what's going to happen. Um, but just like anything political, um, it, it does take time to change. You know, I think that's how our, our government was built from Senate, Congress, president, not one form uh, makes all the decisions it has to be some sort of uniform uh, unity amongst them. So it'll take some time. Do you have a sense of what is the platform or what is the policy that uh, coalitions are getting behind that some of these candidates represent? Like, because, you know, I think of San Francisco, there's there's multiple things happening all at the same time. You have uh, sort of a decriminalization, a decriminalization element. You know, you hear the stories about, hey, under a thousand bucks, you can steal anything you want. That's one thing. How true or not, you can speak to that. You've got the homeless population issue that, you know, that seems to be uh, growing and maybe becoming more aggressive because of maybe the decriminalization side of it. Uh, you have the, the exodus of offices, office space. You have the, the, the rising cost. There's all these different things. So what is it from a policy perspective? And I, I just, I'm very fascinated about San Francisco. I'm actually trying yeah. to book an author to come on who wrote a book about the San Francisco real estate market, no, like the commercial market. It's like a CNN, a CNN anchor who wrote a book on this. So I'm really curious about this. Like, what is it? What is the policy or set of policies that are being pushed right now? If you know, and if you don't just say, move on, I don't know. Um, that seem to be the tide change that San Francisco needs. Yeah, by no means am I politically involved to no, exactly. Um, sure. The fine print. But from my observation, it really comes down to what matters most for families, um, from safety to schools to... I think safety is the number one concern when you think about San Francisco right now from theft, right. break-ins, um, you know, a lot of homeless, drugs that are like the open markets uh, close to downtown. 
I think there's there's funding behind the wrong incentives. And I think over time, hopefully, we'll see more and more funding towards the right incentives instead of you know funding people to be on the streets and there's billions of dollars spent towards that. Um, that's not creating change in the way people behave. So uh, there's more conversations about maybe more practical things that should be done um, to get people off the streets or, you know, from there, there's, there's whole debate between um, schools and admissions. And um, yeah, there's, there's, I guess I don't have too much to comment on it. I'm, I'm more of a spectator since I'm out of the city now, but mm -hmm. I think um, the basic human needs of the sense of safety, the sense of um, community, like, I, I hope it's going in the right direction. Past that, I, I don't have too many details. Uh, me too. It's a be beautiful yeah. city, man. It's a beautiful city. It's it's. I was always sad to see. I've spent. I've I've been there in chunks. It's like a. Uh, uh, what's that? What is that? Um, that thing you had as a kid where you'd look through and you'd press the button and it would like sh uh, shift the the scene. Oh yeah, I don't even know what that's called, but I know exactly her, what you're talking about. Whatever it is, to, but like I've had that. Water, yeah. Yeah, over like a decade and a half, I've had that sort of view of San Fran. Like first time I went, like, wow, this is a cool city, right? Lombard Street and all that's going on downtown, Pier yeah. 39, all the touristy stuff, the Giardelli district. And then the next time I went, I'm like, something feels a little, you know, years later, feels a little bit degraded. I can't I can't quite put my finger on it. Like a lot of homeless, but it wasn't overwhelming. And then I went to actually the GoBundance event, uh, the champion event in um, yep. April of last year, I think it was, April 2022. And it was a, I mean, it was post pandemic, you know, we're coming out of it and California was a little bit delayed, more delayed than some other states maybe in, in declaring an end to it. So there was that element, but it was like, whoa, like it felt just completely different from the 15 years before or whatever. So I hope, I hope for its sake and for those that are around it, that it has, that it's on its way back, you know? I hope so, so too. And I think it, it is, it's, it's a combination of the pandemic for sure. So we're now three years removed from it and it crazy. Should get better. crazy where you are Southern market residential market you said prices are holding firm um where god knows where we are in this cycle i know there's a couple more interest rate hikes to come still but what are you seeing i'm just you've been in the market long enough you know what what do you what is your what's your best case worst case for the areas outside of the city where you are the residential markets where you are best case worst case over the next year to 18 months yeah um even leading up to right now multiple offers is still expected even though we're at the end of the summer and inventory tends to peak in our market in october so from now until october it'll slow down and of course q4 is going to be slower i think the seasonal trend is still going to follow we still had a seasonal you know uptick in sales activity and now we're at the tail end of the summer so we expect that next year um obviously we know yesterday they raised uh the Fed rate by another 25 basis points. I follow a tool that the markets kind of anticipate what's going to happen for the next couple of Fed meetings. And so far, it's saying that we're, we should expect pauses for the rest of the year and potentially a first cut by March. Who knows how true that's going to be if it follows through on that. But um, if that is, if that were to play out, that first cut is going to be during the beginning of the spring market, which I do anticipate if, if both of those coincide together, it's going to be a really hot market considering we did have a, a relatively strong seller's market this year in the Bay Area. Um, if rates hold steady for the rest of, you know, longer than that period of time into next year, I still think we're going to have a strong market. Sales prices are down from the peak about 12 to 15%, depending on where you're at. However, prices past that have not gone lower. And the reason why is everyone like, I, I work with the sellers um, on the seller side and in a normal year, two thirds of our business is owner occupant sales. In, di in this past like six, seven months this year, majority of our listings were absentee owners, inheritances where they have stepped up basis and you know, they don't care if the prices are down 10%. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, um, that's death, divorce, that's like circumstantial reasons that people move that their motivation is greater than, you know, gaining an extra 10%. Inve um, investor properties are also on that list of, um, of uh, higher kind of uh, quantity of listings. And that's because people are retiring, they're simplifying in their lives. They don't want to manage property anymore. So it's kind of flipped in terms of owner occupants. I think a lot of them are holding out. They have low rates. They 
will make do with what they have at this very moment. And I think there's a lot of pent up demand when rates trend lower, whether that's next year or another year out. Um, yeah, there's like 40% in our market is 40% less transactions to go around, um, which move up buyers have a hard time moving up. First time home buyers don't have much inventory and selection to purchase from. So that's why prices are very, very steady. What is your origin story in real estate? What's up tribe listeners. I want to talk about our sponsor for today's episode, go abundance the tribe for healthy, wealthy, generous people who choose to live epic lives. It's a tribe I've been a part of for five years now. And it's, I keep coming back year after year because of the quality of the connections and interactions that I get and the accountability that I get toward the goals that I'm looking to achieve. Go abundance has meant everything to me. So I'm really, really proud to sit here on the tribe of millionaires podcast and tell you a little bit about go abundance. Here's the thing. Why do you live where you live? Think about it. Why do you live in the neighborhood you live in or the apartment building you live in or wherever it might be? Usually people move into a community because of the quality of the neighbors and all of the amenities that are available to them. And then they go about using those amenities and leveraging that community to the best of their ability for growth. They make connections with neighbors, lifelong friendships, things that serve them. We want that for ourselves, for our wives or husbands and our children. That's what GoBundance is at the next level. Imagine if you're a man moving into a community of other millionaire men that are driven toward being the best versions of themselves as fathers, as husbands, in their health, in their relationships, in their contribution, you name it. That's what GoBundance provides. For me, it's been everything. I get with my GoBundance brothers on a weekly basis and I tell them, this is where I'm trying to go. Things I can't share with the regular folks in my life, my friends, my family that I've known forever. They only know me for who I've been. GoBundance guys, they know me only for who I'm becoming. And when I deviate, when I go off course from being that guy, from taking action toward being that guy, that's when they step in, that's when they hold me accountable, and that's what accelerates my growth. Go to GoBundance.com right now and apply. If you're a millionaire and a man, GoBundance.com. If you're a woman and a millionaire, GoBundanceWomen.com. And if you're not quite a millionaire, go to GoBundanceEmerge.com and you join me in the community that I've created in partnership with GoBundance to get yourself to that place of being what we call a whole life millionaire. GoBundance.com. You can start there, see everything that we have to offer. It's an incredible community. I can't wait for you to be a part of it. Now, back to the show. Where were you before? Why get into real estate? Give me a little bit of that backstory. Yeah. Um, I got exposed early as a kid. I would walk into a three bedroom apartment family, like three full families live in each bedroom uh, on behalf of my parents who rented to them in the city. And I would collect rent in cash. And <laughs> um, I was just, I grew up around real estate, not sales, but property management, dealing with tenants, you know, going to court evictions. And it gets really complicated in San Francisco with just cause eviction and, and all that. So um, that's how I got my start. Um, I think why did I get into the business was because I saw my parents, they, they were in small business. They were import exporters of seafood where we drove from San Francisco down to Ensenada, Mexico, and we would eventually have enough uh, seafood to send to Asia to sell. It was somewhat of a high capital intensive business, high risk, but also I guess higher reward than just working a normal W2. So for me, when I graduated out of college, they sunset that business and I obviously couldn't continue. I, I also didn't want to. It was, it was a bit risky. Um, so I got into a business that I felt time and effort could make a big difference and impact for people's lives, which ultimately dictate compensation. So I solve people's problems with, you know, one of the biggest assets that they own. And that's how I got into real estate. Wow. I love that. You have this uh, saying over your shoulder that's staring at me and I, I just, I have to ask about it. Just own it. Is there any meaning to that? Any d d deep meaning to that? Yeah. So our, our, our brand, our, our company is called own real estate. So we believe in ownership of real estate. It's a play on words. Um, it's clearly we've seen over years that it's a great hedge against inflation and inflation mm -hmm. has been the talk over the last 12 months. So, uh, just own it means somewhere a play on words on, um, you know, another brand that has a just a blanket, um, is to, figure out a way to become a homeowner, figure out a way to invest in real estate. 
Now, given the last 12 months, I think there's more concern that is this the right time to pull the trigger? But just like entering any asset class, whether it's financial instruments, stocks, bonds, anything, um, I think there's a saying that you, sh you, sh you can't time the market, but time in market really matters. So if you have deployable dollars, you should invest over the period of time that you plan to invest anyways, um, just because maybe right now there's more uh, liquid um, Vanguard accounts or savings accounts that give you high yield, which didn't exist maybe a couple months back, but that's now an option. But prior to that, I think putting your money into something that hedges against inflation, appreciates over time, gives you tax benefits, clearly a lot of that correlates to real estate. And that's why we believe in ownership of any type of real estate. That's that, so are you, you're, you're, the people on your team, the people in your brokerage, you're, you're encouraging ownership amongst those that work with you. So this is a, 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 a mission for the employees that you have. Is that accurate? Yeah, um, it's, it's both. So I would say I have two clients. It's my agents and it's my client clients, uh, buyers and sellers. So um, a lot of people from a client perspective, uh, I, I definitely believe after you purchase your primary, obviously that's the first concern until you can accomplish that. Then you should start focusing on having different assets. Um, a lot of people in our area work for tech companies and naturally they already have stocks in these companies and they're somewhat well-versed in the stock market because they follow the trends on what's going on because they own a piece of the company, so to say. Sure. Um, and to di diversify, they eventually could invest in real estate. Now for our agents or any field of, of that matter, uh, any employment, it's you make great income um, no matter how you make it. But I think if you look at, especially in our area, a lot of the old money, it didn't matter what they did in their jobs, but it mattered where they put their money because in our area, real estate has tremendously increased in value over the last 10, 20, 30 plus years. Mm. So I think a lot of people that used to be, you know, part of a union and um, they they worked on commercial real estate and they, they were just um, paid employees. They, if they invest in real estate, they did really well. Um, if they were, you know, someone that was high up in, in tech or, they like just any industry that anyone came from. I feel like a lot of people that own real estate here locally, they did really well. And that that's a nest egg that we help with. Unfortunately, when people pass and the kids inherit uh, the property, we help them with selling it. And obviously they can choose what they want to do with the money after they sell it. But makes sense um, for, for you personally, what's your, what is your investment, uh, uh, thesis at portfolio? Like, what are you, where are you directing your, your funds? What assets are you collecting? Yeah, that's such a great question because I just went to the deal, uh, due diligence oh. class with Matt King in Austin, yeah. by the way, was um, it good? 40 other real abundance members. Yeah. Um, and that class challenged us to think of our thesis which obviously it's still, a it's always a work in progress. Even if you have a goal, you, you readjust it, right? So um, for me right now, I'm prioritizing cash flow, and similar to a lot of GoBundance members, whether they're quitting their jobs or um, they want to have a little bit more freedom, time freedom, uh, they don't want to be locked down, so to say, by their hourly job. Um, so I've invested in syndications, I've invested in commercial real estate out of state, strip mall, uh, storage facilities, our office here that we own, obviously, um, for multiple reasons, not just the income, um, the protection of our money, uh, but also the write-offs that you get. Um, and you couple that with, as we know, um, satisfying as a real estate professional, then we can write it off against our active income, which is you compound your money over time, which I've learned from GoBundance, by the way. I wasn't mm -hmm. well-versed until I got into GoBundance. But I, I, I love to invest in anything right now i track my deployable dollar at every during every year just like the one sheet you know kind of encourages us to track and at the end is how much did i actually deploy of that money and i think that's so important um, of course there's other important pillars as we will talk about but sure. being able to get to the point where you're not trading time for money uh, for your whole adult career is a, a really worthy goal to strive for because if you are able to accomplish it sooner, you're not going to trade time anymore. You're just going to spend time with your family and you don't have to think about, do I need to show up to work tomorrow? If I don't have to, 
obviously that's a better choice to make that I don't have any worries and I can have 10 out of 10 attention with my family, with the, my loved ones. So. Wow. That's incredible. The, um, I'm curious on that, on that workshop, what was, so the investment thesis was sort of the takeaway. Uh, was there anything that jumped out a, a fact, a, a moment, a, a deliverable, yes. a piece of advice? Yeah. What, what was it? I would say for me, the biggest takeaway, although I, I know there's certain, uh, things that we, we will keep in that room. The biggest takeaway for me is when Matt King shared with us that, um, one of the people that, uh, he supports has invested and gets, um, K ones from over 200 different, uh, investments that he's made throughout his career. And if he just focused on his, um, if he just focused on what he was really knowledgeable at, which is multifamily, and he just put, instead of putting it into different 200 different investments, but poured it into one type of investment that he knew, he would have been a lot more well off financially if he didn't actually diversify. Um, and as we know, there's a challenge on chasing K1s too, if, uh, these companies don't do well, or these companies don't have proper reporting. So that's one of my biggest takeaways. And from being in GoBundance, not just elite, but champions, what I realized was as much as a lot of people strive to get their horizontal income numbers higher, the real way you can get that higher is if you have a really strong vertical. So of course you get to a point where you don't want to have a high vertical, you want a high horizontal, but to work towards that, you can expedite it by having a, a way to, you know, have a huge amount of money coming in every year. So, um, I guess what, what I'm trying to say is to summarize that my takeaway is to focus on what you are really good at, whether it's with your time or whether it's what you're familiar with, because the more time you spend, you're just going to become a, a good, you know, custodian of money in that regard. I guess is what I'm trying to say. That, that, that resonates so much with me. There was a, there's a guy in GoBundance, I won't say who, who, who blew up in, in a good way. Like he blew up his, his net worth exploded. All of a sudden he like, we double tripled, whatever it was. And, um, um, uh, when you dissected it down, cause there's always this discussion, especially in emerge, right. Emerge sort of being the future, future, uh, millionaires group or whatever about horizontal income. And I think it's like, I, I, I think the image I have and I am guilty me as well. Is like I got this fifty or hundred or two, whatever the amount is, two hundred grand, and I, how do I make this pay for my life? Like <laughs> I got, I got this. I built this thing. I, how do I make it pay for my life? And the answer is you don't. You can't. Not just that. It's got to be a compounding thing time after time. But what I learned from this guy who came down here to the DR with me, um, uh, he and his family were down here, was um, he had two. So one, he pivoted to something he loved. That was one thing, right? He pivoted from something he wasn't great at to something or something he didn't love, but he was doing well with to something he loved. And there was an inherent risk in making that change, but he felt aligned. And then part two was he had two huge years, two huge verticals, right? He went into the real estate uh, uh, brokerage space, real estate agency space. He had two big seven figure years income wise. And then he took like whatever his base expenses were really didn't change. So he had all this extra thanks to being rep status, was able to write, write off a lot against it, all this extra and dumped it into uh, a specific asset class that he invested in. Good markets, inflation, it goes up, passive income came in. His specific strategy was more of, wasn't short term, but it was, it was akin to short term. So it was a, a cash flow and equity play, but it was two big years to your point. Like that accelerated him, two big vertical years that he'd got when he was in a fulfilling role. So I think that's like the dirty little secret of horizontal income. Like I see the finished product. I see Pat Hyben or David Osborne or whomever as like, oh man, like, you know, they're kind of my age. They're about a decade older than me, but whatever, like 10 years older than me. I feel 40 years away from that, but I should be closer to where they are. So here's my 200 grand. How do I make this make me 200 grand this year? You know, kind of thing. When the reality is aligned vertical income, aligned with who you are, what you're great at, allows you to be focused on it, grow it and topple that into horizontal and that's where it builds. I, you can dissect my ramblings, but is that essentially what you're, what you're learning or what you've learned or what your thesis is as well? It, it's definitely in line with that. And it, it makes a lot of sense. And what I will say is if I, if I was exposed to go abundance a little earlier, 
Ugh. not to say that I, I didn't know what to invest in or, um, I, I think it gave me a little bit more clarity of direction and more examples. Like you mentioned a couple of people that are at that point where their horizontal is massive and that's, <laughs> that's what they focus on. They don't have to have a vertical. Um, and I think we all go through phases. Um, I don't think like a lot of people, there's less people like that just yeah. because they've worked so, so long to get to that stage. Um, and a lot of it is awareness. Like I think society is taught to trade time for money and you can trade more time. You can work harder. You can earn a higher wage, which all contribute to how much you can deploy to create horizontal. But, um, I think there's a bit of wishful thinking to think that it could happen just because you want it, uh, more immediately. And I think it takes a lot of intention to build over time. Um, so maybe going back to the thesis is I'm 35 now. My goal is to add 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90,000 to my horizontal. And I break it down to if my average return is seven to 10% of my money, then mm. how much do I need to invest on an annual basis? Which means how much do I need to make that's uh, minus my personal expenses and taxes to be able to deploy that amount. And that also means that I need to find the things that get me to seven to 10% return. Wow. Um, so that's how oh, I've that, broken it down. Thanks to you to one sheet, by the way. So that's great. That's a, that's another level deeper though. I'm actually curious to see that. That's amazing. That's really cool. That's a great, great way to do it, right? Like get it down to like, that's my number. Now, you know what you have to target every year. So incredible. Yeah. Because if I add the 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, then I'm going to be at 250, 300%er based on where I'm at today. That's amazing. The financial and, freedom percenter. Percentage. In how many, in how many years? In five years. Five years. God bless you, yeah. man. That's incredible. I love that. All right, let's dive into these GoBundance member questions. So we have six pillars in GoBundance. There's horizontal income, bucket list adventure, age-defying health, uh, genuine contribution, <laughs> extreme accountability, and uh, genuine uh, and uh, uh, authentic relationships. Man, I stumbled through that, but we got it. In which one of those six pillars are you crushing it? I would say... Horizontal income, not because of what I have coming in now, but the clarity I have in terms of how I'm going to build it. And that is definitely thanks to um, having examples in the tribe, seeing where people have, you know, uh, made mistakes to shortcut it for me to understand that uh, I don't have to make the mistakes on my own, um, but also having speaking the same language of various people in different industries investing in different things and um i think just that exposure and awareness alone helps align and, and focus um where i know i need to be and i'm going towards so that's why i would say horizontal income is the one that um i i don't even sweat so to say i don't really need to intensely think about or um worry about. Um, it, I know it's going to happen because, because of the awareness and exposure that I have. Yeah. Yeah. What you, what you, what does it say? What you measure gets done, something like that. So, um, yeah. what you I measure improves and gets done and yeah. No, I, it's funny. I, yeah, we'll talk after cause I'm really, I'm really curious about your system on that. I think that's fascinating. Which one of those pillars could you use more support and accountability in? I will definitely say bucket list adventures. I will tell you, I grew up as a sheltered kid. Very, I'm still introverted for the most part. Um, and I used to play a lot of video games and I see business as the ultimate video game because it actually impacts your life. Um, so when it comes to bucket list adventures, I'm not a, you know, there's on the other side of the spectrum is let's say an adrenaline junkie that wants to chase, um, various adventures and experience different things. I personally don't have as strong of a desire for that, but I realize that if I have more experiences, I know it's going to improve the way I think and um, help me understand the world better. So that's definitely one that I would say I need to work on. The, the, the video game of my life is driving in central Dominican Republic. It is, it is crazy. The bikes and the tuk-tuks and the cars going like, it's, it's like a video game. It's crazy. So, um, when you said that, I always I reference believe that. Yeah. Driving here being nuts, but it is what it is. Where in your life are you potentially flirting with disaster? I will say the one that I've always struggled with, I, I wouldn't say it's disaster, but I know I can definitely do better is authentic relationships. And what mm -hmm. I mean by that is 
when it comes to just my close circle of family and friends, I feel like I'm doing pretty good. But because of maybe my introverted tendencies, I'd rather just stay home, just be with my dogs, which I don't think that's a problem, like gives me thinking time. But that also means, you know, if just if I'm spending an hour of time, am I spending it alone or with other people? And I feel like I could be much more intentional in building stronger relationships or building new relationships. Um, and I kind of, kind of do that in business. Like in our business, we track conversations and attempts to have conversations. So, but that's like intentional for business. I wouldn't say it's authentic to my, my personal like relationships that I would want to build. So that's something that I know I don't spend enough time on. Um, I definitely, it, it's in the back of my mind, but, um, it's not as intentional. What's the objective on, on, on you going outside of sort of your introverted tendencies to network more, what's the objective? What's, what are you optimizing for? If you were to, if you were to stretch a bit, you know, what comes to mind is how I've been positioned because of my parents to have the relationships that they have, their friendships that they have. So I think about my future self and my kids, like how can I help them with relationships that I might have, right? You know, I'm, I could just be a phone call away from making an introduction for their first job or for a, a mentor that they are interested in something that they want to do. Um, so maybe it's a little less selfish for what I want out of it. If I'm thinking really um, intentional, it's more so like for future benefit or maybe even for me to be able to understand what I can contribute to, because I would say one place, one bucket that I need to work on as well as contribution. I just haven't found um, an organization or a cause that I feel very compelled and passionate about to give my time and, and money to yet. I mean, I've given, but not sure. to the extent that I feel the tribe kind of encourages because I truly believe there's the law of reciprocity. The more you give, the more you're going to receive anyways. I just haven't found a one that, um, you know, I think authentic relationships is tied to that. Uh, to the contribution. So makes sense. Makes sense. And you said future, do you have future kids? Or do you have kids now? I'm expecting my first. So you are congratulations. Do you know what it is or are you able to reveal? Yeah, it's a boy and end of September. So nice, uh, nice. Uh, as I hear, I'll be a game changer. So, um, <laughs> it'll make you way more know efficient. What, what I don't know. Yeah. It'll make you more efficient having a kid, not it. He, he will make you more efficient. It's, uh, um, I believe you. Yeah. It's one of those things like, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll laugh at the idea of any friends that you have who don't have kids and they say, oh man, just super busy right now. <laughs> you'll, you'll, just, <laughs> you'll just sort of laugh at them like, dude, you, yeah, you have no idea. Cause you are busy. I mean, you are busy. You're a busy guy. They're busy, but like, it's just another level of busy. It's a, a switch that never turns off busy, but, um, but right. otherwise, you know, you, you prepare as best you can, but I, I always liken parenthood to investing in real estate. Like you could talk about it all day. You can listen to every bigger pockets episode, but until you buy that property and until that property does something that you never expected or never heard on episode, you know, 212, then you don't know. You have to buy the property to really understand what it is to be an investor. And it's the same thing. Like until you don't sleep six nights in a row because that baby won't sleep, you don't understand like you know that you won't sleep, but you don't know what it's like not to sleep <laughs> until you go through that that run. So It'll be a, it'll be amazing. The phases go quickly, you know, all the stuff, all the nightmares people talk about, it all goes quickly and it is incredible, but, uh, thank you for the expectation setting. Um, <laughs> I'm mentally preparing here. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. Buy, buy every sleep gadget that you can find swings, rock and plays, pack and plays, you need buy every swing device, every sleep device. Don't, you all won't right. be wasting your money. You won't be wasting your money. <laughs> I'll take your um, money. Yes, please do. All right. In what specific way, uh, and you kind of referenced a couple, maybe there's something different that you want to talk about, but a specific way that GoBundance has impacted your life. I will say I am, I am grateful to be a part of this tribe because I feel like there's so many people in the tribe that are in various departments, whether you want to categorize it by the pillars or um, by you know their, their goals or where they're at in life. There are multiple steps ahead of me. And what they share gives me insight to what I should expect or what I can change or what mistakes I can avoid um, or what I can really shortcut. Uh, for example, talking about the horizontal income part. Um, 
the people that I've met have introduced me to my tax preparer, the syndicators mm -hmm. I invest in, um, and so many other relationships that I wouldn't even say is just the knowledge, but it's the connections that have been made through GoBundance um, because everyone's on the journey. I'll, I'll say, quote unquote, the journey, but everyone's at a different part of the journey and there's they're openly sharing and um, there's, there's nothing held back. And it's just a place and an environment that um, people feel comfortable sharing about themselves. And in return, um, it, it, it fosters an environment where people are really authentic. And I, I learn from, you know, that's, it's hard to find a group like that. So. Yeah. No, I agree. It, there's a great Alex Hormozzi quote. Uh, we pay for every lesson with either time or money and we use the currency we value least, right? Mm. I love that quote because it's what you just described. You know, I talked to a lot of people about GoBundance, they call and ask or whatever. And I'm like, you know, the investment is this, emerge five grand, 12, five for elite, 20 grand for champion, right? Like there's this investment that you got to put into being a member of it. And it, it, it can pucker some assholes, right? Like, whoa, 20 grand or 12 grand. Like, you know, ah, you know I've, I've got this deal coming up, but what about this? Is it going to work? It's like, well, it's not a thing that works. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a country club or it's a neighborhood. It's something you kind of go in and you, you, you benefit from being around the people or whatever. But that's, that's the thing. Like I, I know in my time in GoBundance, I've actually calculated it's over a million dollars earned in equity and income that I can directly correlate to relationships in GoBundance versus say, I don't know, $80,000 in tuition and event costs that I paid over the last four years or so, right? So yeah. you're going to pay with either time or money and we, we use the currency we value least, right? So, so, um, or not, we use the currency. We, yeah, we use the currency we value least. So, um, I value time over money. So I'd rather put my money down to buy me time. And I think you caps encapsulated that really well. Yeah, if I could add a little bit to that too is, I mean, tangibly, um, I've gotten in, in my business a referral every year that's covered the fee anyway. So from a fee standpoint, <laughs> True. I think I do think a lot of people do see it as a big lump sum that's like, oh my gosh, like, is it worth it? And what I will say is, as long as you are seeking, you will find. So the more proactive you are in seeking a relationship or seeking information, there's always someone or definitely multiple people that have the experience that you're trying to shortcut or trying to obtain. Um, and it is, it is definitely worth it. And I, I spend a lot of money on self-education and, um, yeah. this is something that I continue to obviously pay for or invest in my future, as I would yeah. like to say. I love that. No, it's a great point. Great point. What advice would you give? And he kind of gave some now, but maybe there's some more. What advice would you give to a new or prospective member of a GoBundance community? I would say maybe two things. First is talk to as many people in a tribe as possible. Get Do a reverse reference check. Like, hey, what do you like about this group? What do you dislike? What have you learned? What do you feel you thought you anticipated and you didn't receive? And then secondly is, I don't know if GoBundance does this, but I feel like there were events that allowed guests figure mm -hmm. out which events allow guests take some time away from your daily life and go talk to people in person and go experience it in person um, i think that will give you the exposure you need um, those two items great point yeah there yeah still definitely we have we have guests i think the the tahoe event sold out so fast that there were no guests it was like every member just bought it up but like lake Oconee, there's some spots for guests and and uh and i think some of the local chapter stuff there's spots for guests too so that's great advice that's unique advice first time i've gotten that advice on this so thank you you made it different <laughs> so let's wrap this with a question from the GoBundance card game the nine of uh clubs clubs yeah <laughs> clubs and spades confuse me what's something that you've done that you would try to dissuade others from doing Something you've done, you would try to dissuade others from doing. Um, I would say you will get excited because everyone's going to talk about cash on cash return, horizontal income, um, which don't get me wrong. I'm still excited about that. <laughs> but there's a reason why I went to the due diligence class, because I know I can do a much better job in vetting where yeah. I put my money. Um, now putting your money and investing it also might mean that you are relinquishing control of what you're investing in. So you really want to do a good job in understanding 
who's behind the deal, what are they doing, um, how are they driving value for the investment that you're putting money towards. And um, that's, that's probably my best answer. It's to be a very good custodian of your money, as good as you think you are, just like anything, health, fitness, um, familial relationships, you can always do better. So I just think about like what mistakes have I made and um, not mistakes. Now it's like lessons. I paid for these lessons. Um, what can I do better in the future? And I would say that's what it is. Yeah, I'm uh, I am a I have definitely gone the group think route on a couple of investments. No doubt. That is exactly what we talked about. The group think the herd think is uh, a tr sometimes a trap. So be yeah. careful. Yep. One of them, <laughs> one of them hasn't done well for me, but thankfully it was a smaller investment. One of them has gone well and I hope to God it continues to, but, um, but yeah, in an up market, you know, like everybody's a genius, everything sounds great. And I wasn't even like, you know, Oh, look at these cash on Kelly. Like, this is like a 40 IRR. I wasn't bought into that, but it was just well, a lot of smart people invested here. So, you know, how could I go wrong? <laughs> exactly. Right. Someone else vetted it. So I don't need to vet it. Right. Let's right, put right. more money together. You're guilty. doing it too. Okay. <laughs> guilty, 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 guilty. Wilson, Leon, this is awesome, man. I appreciate, I love getting to know people through this. So thanks for coming on and doing this. Uh, where can people learn more about you? Website, uh, social media handle, anything like that you want to share? You can probably find me on Facebook, my first last name or Instagram, Wilson, W-L-R-E-A. I'm happy to help um, in any way. Appreciate you, man. Thanks for coming on. Thank you.